This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. The two witnesses are eagerly anticipated by those who know the Bible prophecies, but to the world, they will appear as the enemy. As Doug Hamp explains, what unfolds will be a superhero movie turned upside down as the world considers God's messengers evil and embraces Satan as its hero. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, there you are, Shabbat Shalom Torah fans. It's Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. And tonight is the first Shabbat of the eighth month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. There, you see it right there. You can see this month's calendar page and even get a full calendar for yourself, although you'll have to wait until after Shabbat when the store opens back up, at uh, rootawakening.tv slash calendar. Now, last week we started a new series with Doug Hamp where he uses a fictional sci-fi superhero story to lead people through the book of the Revelation. And tonight, he talks about the two witnesses part of that story. Let's talk about Revelation with my co-host, Tiffany Panaccio, and the man who considers Revelation to be the easiest book in the Bible to understand, Michael Root. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Thanks, Shabbat God. Shalom. Michael, how is that? How, everybody's so confused, and everybody's got all this conjecture and a different weird ideas about Revelation. I mean, how do you see it so simply? Oh, uh, well, we have... Uh, first of all, seven seals and, and the events that play out in each one of those seals. And then seven trumpets and the events that play out in the seven trumpets. And after that, we have the seven bowls of wrath. And we have the events on earth that play out because of that. So it's all in chronological order. Mm. Even the two witnesses are, are, are rehearsed for for all time in the in the calendar, mm. the two witnesses they they are the ones that are called up to the Temple Mount yeah. to say to speak of their sighting of the new moon that starts every month, and without them we don't have any idea what time it is. But when we have the the calendar right, it, it, then we go to the book and we find out it's all in order. Okay, so the two witnesses, what you're saying here is that th the first time they appear is not in Revelation. There have been two witnesses throughout biblical history yes. to basically s herald the new that, That's right. Every official state function of Israel has the two witnesses representing Moses and the prophets. Every, oh, okay. every, every official state-sponsored uh, uh, state event. Okay. As those. So this is why we need to know our biblical history, our Hebrew history, how Hebrew works, how the you know how the whole that whole uh, uh, culture works to understand from our Western mindset what's really going on here and why these two witnesses are yeah. there. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, in the first couple of verses of Revelation, you have to understand all the Gospels because that's the basis of it. Mm. And then it goes from there. So Revelation, according to the new book, by the way, that's yes. sitting right by Michael here. <laughs> well, that's th right. So that's why it's a fifth <laughs> gospel. Yes. That's an additional gospel. Not another gospel, but a fifth gospel. It's called that in the manuscripts. It's good news. Okay. Good news for those who love is coming, but bad news for everybody else. That's right, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. So and that book you're holding, sorry, go ahead, oh, Tiffany. No, I was gonna say that's why everyone doesn't like the two witnesses, because it's bad news for everybody else. Exactly, right, <laughs> yeah, there's like, us, yeah, yeah, we think of the, the superheroes, but yeah, so that's the way that this this book of Dr. Doug Hamp goes. And Michael's got the, the Revelation, the fifth gospel. This is based on the Chronological Gospel season two video series, which we turned into a book. And Michael, you got the other one too there. That is for season uh, that's one. Right. The, the this greatest. is uh, this was encapsulated in in series uh, one. Right. Yes. The greatest story never told. Now, when we did Revel when we did the Revelation, and we were trying to figure out where to shoot it, and I had recently gone to this place, and I said, "Oh, we, we there's a creepy beach that I just went to, and I didn't realize what it was, and it was." Um, 
uh, uh, Driftwood Jekyll Beach. Island. Jekyll Island, yeah. yeah. Jekyll Island. Right. Where the monster from Jekyll Island was was written about that. Really? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I that's didn't know that. that's where the uh, Federal Reserve was was hatched. That whole plan. The monster indeed. So Yeah. <laughs> and it really is a scary place if that's where the Federal Reserve was created. Yeah. <laughs> we we pretended it was Patmos Island. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was I thought it was pretty fitting how we had some special effects of bombs going off on the horizon there and all kinds of stuff. It was a fun time. So yeah, so you can get these now in book form. And we have the uh, we have the, the love gift in front of us, but we're going to let the commercial do the talking there. So anyway, great new love gift, all talking about biblical dating, some wonderful things to thank you for your donation. And your donations is really what we need right now. Guys, I tell you what, a lot of ministries are going to shut their doors December 31st. We don't want to be one of them. And I know you don't want us to be one of them, okay? So we need your support right now. Things are lean everywhere. Uh, Obviously, this is a very tumultuous time in the world, so we need your support. Stand with us, stay strong with us, and we just want to thank yeah. you for that in yeah, advance. Yeah, we're not pulling back at all. No. That's why we have Jake on every Wednesday night. That's right. Yeah. Because we're moving ahead. We're moving ahead. We're being rude. Yeah. You got to be rude this day and age. You know what Full I mean? Steam you ahead. Push yeah. the envelope. Exactly. Yep. All right, speaking of being rude, the two witnesses are sure going to look rude. <laughs> they are eagerly anticipated by us, though, those who know the Bible, right? But to the world, they will appear as the enemy. And Doug Hamp explains what unfolds will be a superhero movie turned upside down that the world considers God's messengers as evil, embraces Satan. It's crazy. So stay tuned. Right after the Kiddish with Michael, we'll get into it. On Friday, the sixth day of the week, the markets in Jerusalem are filled with challah that is done differently than it is any other day of the week. On that day, the challah is covered with honey and it is covered with raisins because it is a shadow picture of when the Messiah reigns upon the earth in the Sabbath day or the Sabbath millennium when life on earth will be sweet. Yeshua, the last night, that he had with his disciples before his crucifixion, he took bread and he blessed the Most High. And he said, Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu melech ha'olam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so the sanctification of the Sabbath, the Kiddush that we do, sets apart this day and sets apart this very thing that we had rehearsed from the time that Yeshua gave this to his disciples. And then Yeshua blessed the Most High with this blessing that Melech Zadik said to Abraham when he blessed the Most High. Baruch atah Yehovah Eloheinu Malach HaOlam Berei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, the King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And Yeshua said, this represents the renewed covenant paid for in my blood. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. With that, we do exhibit the Lord's death and what he paid for our redemption until he comes. Well, last week on Shabbat Night Live, we went through the parable, as I like to call it, of the Regenesis Code. is a fictional story about real things that are going to happen, but maybe a different way of thinking about it. So what is this story? How does it all go down? And, and who are the characters in this? Well, let's explore that today with the author, Dr. Doug Hamp. Welcome hey, back to Shabbat Night Live. Thank you. Appreciate it. So last week we kind of uh, teased it with the, the two witnesses, how you thought uh, as a young person, as did I, I mean, most people see the two witnesses in Revelation, who are these guys, uh, they do some stuff, but why are they there? Hey, okay, anyway, let's read the rest, right? <laughs> but then you went back, and so let's just explore that first, and then we'll go into the rest of this. Why, why did you focus on uh, the two witnesses? How did you figure that maybe they were the, the main deal, the main idea? Yeah, well, so here's the thing is that, you know, Satan doesn't know when the curtain is going to go up, right, on stage. He doesn't know. 
only God knows, right? Jesus said, hey, even I don't know, only the Father knows when this is all gonna come down. Sure. Okay, so I don't know how that all that works, but, but at some point, God is gonna say, okay, enough is enough, right? So Satan certainly knows that, right? If we know that, he knows that, probably a whole lot better than we know it. Mm -hmm. So he's going to prepare for that day, right? He's preparing because, again, there's a huge uh, prophecy of doom sta standing over his head that right. the, um, the, son, the seed of the woman, Jesus, is going to crush his head. It doesn't sound like much fun, honestly. He's, he's fighting to win. He's fighting to uh, keep his domain going. So I would suggest that he has been setting the stage ever so carefully so that when the curtain does go up, he's like, I'm ready, okay? You know, okay. He, he's, he's uh, getting everything on stage, everything just properly set up. So what could he be setting the stage with? Well, I think that he's setting it with UFOs, with various messages from out beyond, from the Ascended Masters, Ashtar of the Galactic Command, and all this different stuff um, that people have been receiving for decades now. Uh, you know, starting with the Foo Fighters in World War II and the Flying Saucers, and now we have, uh, you know, UFOs or now the UAPs and whatever they are, there's something really weird and there's something happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's undeniable. I mean, we had the real footage uh, back in 2004, released in 2017, mm -hmm. of Navy pilots that are following this tic tac kind of object that seems to defy all natural law that we understand, right? It can do all these crazy things. Right. So it's, it's not just fantasy, right? We have footage mm -hmm. of stuff, right? By reputable people, by government, and it's now been released to us. I think that's all setting the stage to say, hey, there are these other beings that have been hanging out here, and they're also interested in this, this world, and they wanna see that it, it survives. All right, so what we know from the Bible is that every time God sends a judgment, he always sends a prophet, some kind of a warning okay. before that. Give us some examples. Okay, so in the flood, right? Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So for over 100 years, he's building a boat in a desert mm -hmm. <laughs> or someplace where there's no, no water. He's building a boat. I mean, that right there is a huge testimony. Did you hear about this crazy guy building a boat where there's, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's gonna rain, no, it sure is, you know. So right? an undeniable kind of message that everybody kind of notices. Exactly. Okay. Before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot is there, right? So Lot is also uh, a, a testimony of what's coming. Of course, the two angels come. Ah, okay. Right? And then the Interesting that there's just two of those, by the way. And exactly, okay. right? Yeah. And, and then, of course, the destruction comes. Then you have uh, Jonah, when he goes to Nineveh. He's very reluctant. He wants them to get destroyed. Um, but uh, everybody there repents because they, they heeded the message of the prophet, mm. right? So there's all these times where he sends people, even with uh, Moses and Aaron, right? They go to Pharaoh and they say, hey, let my people go or else, right? Oh, and, yeah. And Pharaoh yeah. says, okay, I... I, I'll take your dare, go for it, let's see what happens. And the plagues begin to come, you know? And there's always a warning. Hey, there's another plague coming, Pharaoh. This could be your chance to repent. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not gonna do it. And then God hardens his heart after he's re unrepentant for quite mm -hmm. a while. God's like, okay, you want that? I'll, I'll help you with that delusion. I'll help you to keep on going. Because now I'm gonna use your recalcitrant heart to, to further you know, my mm -hmm. agenda. Right? And, and so here you have two witnesses coming. They're clothed in sackcloth. That right there. Anytime there's sackcloth, that's always a sign of repentance. Mm. Right? In Nineveh, what did the people do? They all put on sackcloth. Even the animals were wearing sackcloth. Right? Everybody was wearing sackcloth because they were repenting. Mm. And you know, God listened to their repentance. But the world as a whole is going to say, no, we're not interested. But these two witnesses come very much in the the basic tenor uh, and flavor of Moses and Elijah. In fact, I would dare say that they probably are Moses and Elijah. Oh, okay. Right, and they come with superpowers, right? So they're not just coming with a message but no power. They're definitely coming with power. I mean, look, they have, a, they have the power to stop it from raining for three and a half years. They can turn water to blood when they feel like it. They can strike the earth with plagues anytime they feel like it. And then it says, if anybody tries to stop them, that they can, the fire comes out of their mouth. Probably like how Elijah called mm. fire down from heaven 
when the, there were these you know, squads of 50 soldiers that came to try to take them in. And he says, if I really am a man of God, let fire come down and consume you, right? And this happened a couple of times. And finally, the last guy to come around, don't kill me, please. You know, I just got a message from the king, right? Don't kill me. But you know, I think Elijah and Moses are the two witnesses. You know, I mean, if I'm wrong, okay, I'm wrong. But they're certainly coming in the tenor, in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. And who did Jesus meet with on top of Mount Hermon? Moses and Elijah, right? right? And they were shining. Uh, and that's the word when it talks hmm. about, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, in Ezekiel, it talks about the, the, the two kind of sons of light, or the word is Zohar, right? It's kind of these, these glistening ones. I mean, Moses and Elijah were glistening, right? Um, it says anointed ones, but the word in the Hebrew is actually Zohar. All right, so kind of the idea of oil and how it might sparkle with light shining on it. So that's the general idea. So, um, so they come, nobody can stop them. Nobody, that, that tells you that the world is trying to stop them. Why? Because they're doing things that the world doesn't like. They're causing it to stop raining. Hmm. So what if you have no rain for three and a half years? What do you think that's gonna do to the, to the food prices? They're gonna shoot up like mad. What is it going to do to um, to forests? They're going to be dry as can be, which will lead to forest fires, right? And then we're told in the trumpets that one third of the trees and vegetation is going to burn up. Well, that's what would happen if you have no rain for three and a half years. Hmm. Yeah, good right? point. And sure. and if the world knows that these two are responsible, how do how do we know that? Because they're going to say we're responsible for this because we're telling you to repent before the king comes back. Hmm. Right, and so the world is going to hate these two guys, and they're going to know what they're doing. Hmm. Now, what I would suggest is that the world will not see them as um, the two witnesses sent from the Almighty, the God of heaven and earth. I think they'll say, "Okay, these are two guys that represent some alien, some advanced alien out there. Is he powerful? Yes, clearly, hmm. but we don't like him, and we want to try to stop them. We can't, so we need to find a." We need to find a hero that can stop them. And this is where Satan says, I've got a solution for you, right? So in the book, mm. right, this is all, again, not telling you, but showing you right. what this is going to look like, right? So again, it's in story format instead of theology format. Right. So all of these little bullet points I've been telling you are all fleshed out in the story mm. so that you're like, oh, that, okay. You know, and the world might, you think just logically of how, okay, so what's happening right now? So Hamas still, you know, reigning terror and doing crazy things. And, but whenever they do something evil, they take, they, they, they stick their neck out and say, yeah, that was us, yeah, right? Or whatever terrorist group it is. So like you were saying, so all these things happen and the two witnesses say, yes, that was us. People right. go, you know, that, that smells like a terrorist. right? You know, these are the bad guys, right? Yeah. Even though they're doing things on behalf of Yehovah. So, so even now we're setting the stage for that to happen where these things are happening and we're conditioned to yeah. say, whoever sticks their neck out and says we did it, that's the bad guy. Right, yeah, and I think this is where we flip the script. Yep. And I think this is what Hollywood has been doing for years and years. You know, take the, the Avengers, Marvels kind of stuff, right? You know, you have, these humans that somehow become superhuman, they become godlike, mm -hmm. whether it's Iron Man or Captain America or Spider Man. And, it, you know, however they got there, now they're now superhuman. So they're here to save the world, mm -hmm. right? And now there's some hostile force coming from outside the world that's coming to destroy planet Earth. And so we're all going to rally together and we're going to fight the bad guys, right? So if you have two witnesses, but they're not, we don't, we're not going to speak in Bible speak. When these guys come, they're not going to be like, oh, let's open our Bibles and, well, there they are. Right. No, it's going to be, wait, who are these guys? They have superhuman powers. Are they aliens? Apparently, they're extraterrestrials of some sort. And they represent somebody named Elyon or God or Yehovah or, you know, whatever name mm -hmm. they're going to use. People are going to understand that they're representing this other being because they're gonna say that, right? They're coming just like you know Jonah. Hey, repent, or in 40 days, it's all over, right? No, he's, he's, he's gonna say repent. He says, in 40 days, you're all dead, yeah. right? <laughs> but um, you know, their message probably will be something like, he's coming, you know? The, the rightful owner of planet Earth is coming. Uh, you need to repent, and the world's like, no thanks, right? right. So again, all of this is, 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 is in there. So let's back up now. Okay. If the world 
can't fight these guys on their own terms, right? They send their snipers, they send their tanks, they send their planes, and they cannot defeat them because they're using different kind of power. Our fleshly, earthly weapons are no good against these guys. So how do we fight them? Well, we need a champion, a champion that can fight them on, at their own level, mm. right? And this is where I think going to the aliens, the UFOs and the aliens that have been among us, they've, they've told us as much, that they can somehow help us. Is our modern concept of dating contrary to the Bible? And if it is, how are we supposed to get to know someone before we get married? Courting says that you have an intentional purpose that says, I am planning to, I'm looking at you as a spouse, and I think it adds a level of respect mm -hmm. in the process versus our kind of more modern day theology of dating. Using wisdom from the Bible and candid discussion about recognizing character over feelings, the influence of pornography, and the pitfalls of online dating, Rochelle Seifkin lays out Yehovah's ideals for both men and women in this month's Love Gift teaching, Biblical Dating. This teaching is not for sale and it's not available anywhere online. Instead, we'd like to give you this teaching as a thank you gift for donating to A Root Awakening International. When you donate $50 as a love gift in November, you'll get Biblical Dating with Rochelle Seifkin on DVD, Blu-ray, or streaming on the MichaelRood.tv app. Donate $100 and you'll get Biblical Dating, plus a Hebrew Words wall clock, featuring the Hebrew word for each number on the dial, created and printed by women in Jerusalem. Donate $300 and you'll get Biblical Dating, the Hebrew Words wall clock, and a colorful stained glass sun catcher, shaped in the word shalom, meaning peace in Hebrew. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Root to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. When you donate to receive the love gift, you ensure that exclusive teachings like biblical dating keep coming from A Root Awakening International. Use your smartphone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts. Or call 888-766-3610. Or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. So, so in the book, we have the destruction of Damascus, right? Again, yeah, so let's go the, let's go the story here. The story right. is the, that yeah. starts with the, the destruction of Damascus. The de destruction of Damascus, okay. right? Because so in, in, in Isaiah, it says that Damascus would become a ruinous heap, right? So we kind of went with that idea. We're like, well, maybe this could be the catalyst that's going to get everything else started. And again, there, there's the key word. I just want to stop you for a second. Right. Maybe. Yeah. We're not saying Damascus is first, then this happens, then this happens. Exactly. We, we went over that yeah. last week. Is right. that This is not a chronology of things that happen in the Bible. Don't get hung up on that. Right. Just right. go with the flow and let's just have a plausible exactly. uh, you know, example yeah. here, a parable. Right. Well, you know, the question is, you know, which domino falls over first? Do I know? No. But I'm guessing. Okay. So what could it be that could kind of get this whole thing? Now in the Left Behind series, it was the rapture. That was the first domino. And I strongly disagree with that right. position, right? Sure. I think there's gonna be a different domino. But what's interesting, when you start looking at this from kind of a secular mindset or a, a UFO mindset, um, there have been reports by military personnel that, that, um, that UFOs showed up over nuclear silos and they went. They made them go offline, hmm. right? Or not ready, right? So these nuclear weapons that are always supposed to be ready, they're armed and they're ready to go, were suddenly offline, right? And they were not ready to go. And, and it was apparently the UFOs, according to these reports, that were over these nuclear silos, and they turned them off for a bit. Okay. So so in our story, we have the destruction of Damascus. You know, and there's a whole a whole story there, right? Um, but it's blamed on Israel. Uh, and then mm. shortly, shortly thereafter, or right immediately after, we have UFOs showing up worldwide, right? So what we've been seeing with all the different sightings of the UFOs, again, we can't contest that those have been sighted, right? right. But now they're all going to show up sort of at once to make a big grand statement, say, hey, we are against the, the use of nuclear weapons, and we're here to show you that we can turn off your nuclear song. We're the messengers of peace. Yes, we come to bring peace, you know, because we've been living here too and we care about this world and we don't want you guys to kill yourselves because that would be bad for us as well. And when they say peace and safety, mm, 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry. So, so in our story, we have um, Alexander Therian. He's our bad guy. Okay. Okay. Um, though he looks Alexander like a, Therian. Yes, Alexander okay. Therian. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, for, for all you 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 Bible files out there, if you're paying attention, take a look at that name. Okay. <laughs> all right. A little Easter egg there for you. All right. And uh, you can go ahead and and kind of figure out what that means. But. Basically, uh, you know, he's a guy that he's a trillionaire philanthropist. Um, you know, when I first started writing this, I'm like a trillionaire. That's a long way off, but we're getting there. Maybe I mean, not, yeah. You know, <laughs> we got some people that are, are maybe contenders for that. But you know, he has a grand vision of how the world should be, and he's going to use his almost limitless funds to make something. Now, what I would suggest, and I do believe this is what's going to happen, is that the city of Babel, of Babylon, is going to be rebuilt. I really think that's going to happen. Now, I know some people have different positions on that. That's fine, but that's my perspective. You sure. know, I think I think that Babylon is going to be rebuilt. I think that's the only way for what the Bible said about Babylon to actually come to come to pass. I just don't so think it's in, in a literal sense. Sure, yeah. You know, I don't think it's Rome. I don't think yeah. I don't think America is Babylon as bad as we are. You know, I think we're part of the problem, <laughs> but I don't think that we're Babylon. Uh, I think Babylon is Babylon. And, uh, and this all has to do with stargates and all kinds of weird stuff, right? Okay. You know, I mean, Bob El literally means gate of the gods, right? Uh, and who, who established that? Well, that was Nimrod, right? Nimrod, he's the let's rebel guy. Or in, in the ancient uh, world, he was known as Nin Urta, Lord of the Earth, mm. right? And, you know, so there's this connection between Nin Urta and the Antichrist, right? So again, all of these things we're exploring mm. in the book Right? But again, we're showing you, we're not telling you, right? So we're, we're trying to show you like, hey, check this out, you know? Okay. And uh, so, you know, it's a little easier to tell you here on the show, but yeah. in the book, we're showing you what it could plausibly look like. And, and that's the thing, when, when you start allowing yourself to get beyond sort of the, the graphs and the tables and the bullet points and say, okay, how can we actually put these things together? What's a very plausible way that it could all come together? Then we start looking at so yeah, so with what you know with the characters, uh, Alexander Therian, he's he's our ultimate bad guy. He's got a sidekick, Malcolm Sear. He's, Malcolm Sear. Yes. Tell us about Malcolm Sear. Doctor Malcolm. Doctor Malcolm Sear. So okay. he he's an, a renowned physicist. Uh, been working at CERN. Uh, he's trying to <laughs> lovely. Yes, yes, I know. I know. <laughs> we need to spin a little bit of real on the <laughs> CERN. We're gonna put that in there. Well, you know, you know, I'm not against CERN. I, I think yeah. the scientists there are trying to do some great stuff. You know, but it only takes one madman to do something crazy. You know, and you know, CERN is kind of weird. I mean, the opening ceremony uh, for that was uh, at least there was another a tunnel that was opened in in Europe, and it was very weird, very dark, and they had all kinds of uh, cultic things going around with this this tunnel. And then, you know, CERN itself, it has Sheba uh, dancing in front of it. You're like, why is the god of death? Yeah, some, somebody at the top is pulling some strings and they're into weird stuff. Yeah. To say that. It doesn't mean everybody there is weird. It just means that something is off with this mm -hmm. whole place. You know, so again, we, we kind of play on that idea. And, and so Dr. Seer is, is trying to open wormholes. Uh, hmm, you know, right. he's, he's trying to find a way to communicate with the other side. Um, he was a former Jesuit priest and... Um, very disenchanted with the God of the Bible, but he believes that there are things on the other side. Okay. And he wants to make contact with those things on the other side. And so he's using science as a way to open a portal. Hmm. Now, science in and of itself isn't sufficient. And so he needs some kind of a cultic way to, to get to the other side. And so this is where uh, he and others come in contact with uh, Isabel Markov. So she's sort of our woman who rides the beast incarnate, all right? Okay. And, and um, she's very much uh, into, um, well, she's the, the priestess of the goddess Inanna or Ishtar, okay? okay? Uh, and Ishtar, Inanna, is point on, she is the woman that rides the beast, okay? So I actually have a picture, so if we wanna uh, show this, we have a picture of, this I think I do, yeah of the woman who rides the beast, all right? So this is from a cylinder seal. Let me just make that a little bigger. All right, so this is from a cylinder seal. Uh, and you can see there the woman who's riding a beast, right? Okay. This is from like 2100 BC. And this looks kind of Egyptian to me. Is that where this comes from? Uh, it's not Egyptian. This is very much uh, Mesopotamian. Okay. Okay. 
So this is from the ancient culture of Akkad. And um, uh, so this is actually a, a cylinder seal. I have another, uh, here we can show this one right here. So it's the same thing, it's just, you can see this little, it's a cylinder, okay? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, probably not too big. You would then roll it on a piece of soft clay. Oh, okay. And it sort of makes a little movie, okay? Gotcha. <laughs> That's okay. the whole idea. You can keep rolling this thing and it will always make this little, this little, little pattern. This little yeah. pattern, right? And so on that, I'll show the other one because it's a little easier to look at. But you have Inanna on top, Inanna or Ishtar, same woman. She's riding this beast. What is that beast? That's called the Anzu bird. The Anzu bird was the symbol of Enlil. Enlil, now again, I, I go into all this detail in Corrupting the Image Volume 2, right? Mm -hmm. That's this book right here, yep. um, where I talk about how Enlil comes from the Akkadian Elil, which came from the Sumerian Enlil, which meant Lord Wind, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the one who separated heaven and earth. He took earth as his portion. Anu, the creator god, took heaven as his portion. Does this oh. sound familiar at all? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we've heard this story, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and so this Anzu bird was his symbol. Uh, taking a look at this, you can see it's, it's like a lion, but it has wings. It has eagle's talons, right? Now, in, in, in various iterations of this, as time kind of goes on, uh, this... Uh, become stylized in different ways. So right here is another uh, picture. This is uh, the god Pabilsag, or um, um, so isn't it known as Pabilsag. This is from like 1200 BC, all right? Uh, this is the god of death. Now it's a little bit hard to see on this one, but this is a little bit more of a lion or a, a, a horse body kind of a centaur, mm -hmm. right? So he's got a, a man's torso. And I know it's a little bit hard to see right here, but he has two heads. He's got a man's head and a lion's head. He's got wings, he has a scorpion's tail, mm. and he has a serpent head phallus, okay? okay? So if you look at Revelation chapter nine, what do you find there? Something, you got these locusts, they sort of look like horses, right? And then it's got a, a man's torso, a man's head, and it has a lion's head, it has a scorpion's tail and a serpent head phallus. I'm like, wow. oh my goodness, it's That's... all right there. Now think about what does a cherub look like? A cherub has four different faces, right? That of an ox, an eagle, a man, and a lion. These are all the different faces of Satan, right? So sometimes hmm. Satan has a man's face, sometimes he has a, a lion's face, sometimes an eagle's face, and sometimes the face of an ox. Right? And we've seen this in, in tons of, of mythology. You know, for example, uh, when Zeus came down and he took Europa mm -hmm. and, and raped her, uh, he came in the form of a bull, right? So the bull, the bull, the ox, right? That is one of the faces of Satan. Sometimes he comes as a, as a lion, right? Even the Bible says he comes as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? That's another imagery, right. uh, image of, of what he looks like, hmm. right? And so all of these different pictures are some representation of what Satan looks like. Uh, they get stylized a little different over time, but they're all this, still the same basic thing. So the woman that's riding the beast, right, this woman that's riding the beast, so it's, it's, it's Inanna Ishtar, she's on the back of Satan, as it were, mm -hmm. right? who, again, you can see in this picture, he has wings, he's got feathers, he has eagle talons, he has kind of a lion's mouth in this one. That's, that's the imagery. So that's, that's um, uh, Isabel Markov. She is the one who's doing that. So we just, like, there's not an actual right. character in the Bible for this person, right? right. We there's have Jesus. the Antichrist and the, the false prophet. There's no woman who rides the beast character, but we're like, you know, we've seen a character that sort of embodies right. All of that. Again, we're not telling, we're showing. We're showing, exactly. Right, so you know, she does obviously some naughty things, yeah. right? But, but it's all to bring about, like, and here's the thing about, about story, which is kind of fun. You know, on the bad guys team, you know, there's no honor among thieves, right? So everybody wants to be the top dog. Everybody is selfish. They're all looking out for number one. They might be working together, but only as long as it's good for me. Sounds like corporate America. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, the moment I can step on you, I will. Right, Okay. Yeah. You know, and so we kind of have this little power play going on between the different characters, all right? And, and we get into their minds and, you know, they're all kind of thinking, yeah, I'm working with these guys right now, I'm working for this dude, but eventually, I'm gonna be number one, right? And, um, 
And so we have a scene in there where everyone's taking the, the mark, okay? Okay. And we, we get into their minds, you know, and what they're all thinking is, and when, when, they, when they take the mark and they get this incredible surge of power, and then they start thinking, I am God, you know? And, and then they're like, I am God, and everyone's gonna serve me, right? Uh, in this sense of, you know, I'm gonna overthrow this guy or that guy, or in the Star Wars context, right, uh, you know, Luke, together we can rule the galaxy as father and son and we'll overthrow the emperor, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're never gonna serve our master, we're gonna overthrow our master. I think that's the same basic idea. Mm. When, when it's all about self, then self wants to exalt itself to be in the number one place. But in God's economy, self says, no, I, I wanna work with others, I wanna serve others, you know? And, and so that's, again, one of the things that we're, we're showing, not telling, in the story. I'll bet you did not know that being an Ambassador Club member gets you exclusive early access to tickets to in-person events right here at A Rude Awakening headquarters. And I'll bet you didn't know that Ambassador Club members also get private invitations to surprise sales and other appreciation events, not to mention special gifts, cards, and other nice stuff. So why do ambassadors get all these perks? Because ambassador club members are the ones who keep the lights on, who make sure that new teachings keep coming, and they're the ones we can count on because they're committed every month. The Ambassador Club is an automated donation program of $100 a month or more if you'd like. So if you appreciate the consistency of A Rude Awakening videos, social media posts, events, and most importantly, people to pray with you on the phone and help answer your questions, be a part of the consistency that makes it happen. Join the Ambassador Club. How do you illustrate the mark without saying the revelation term of Mark of the Beast? <laughs> well, um, yeah, so we actually came up with a little acronym. So okay. it's a, a molecular regenesis code, okay. Okay, yeah. the MRC. The MRC, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, so we, we have a, a character, uh, Gabriela Levy. She's a world-renowned geneticist, pure heart, you know. Okay. She's, she's the heroine of the, of the book. And she wants to help people, right? She wants to help uh, overcome uh, debilitating disease. You know, and I, I think a lot of things can be done with the right use of genetics. Uh, you know, if people can, can overcome sickle cell anemia, man, hallelujah. You know, that's a disease that is just, I've heard, terribly painful. Um, and if they can overcome this with genetic engineering, great, you know? Yeah. But again, it takes only one madman <laughs> right. to, to use things in the wrong way. So, so she starts to work for Alexander Therian. She's so excited about the money and about the research and this incredible laboratory. And you know she's doing everything for the right reasons, mm -hmm. but eventually she's going to find herself working for the wrong team. Ah, okay. Okay. And she doesn't doesn't realize this for quite a while. She really thinks that he is uh, doing humanity an incredible amount of good, and um, you know her. Not unlike some people in our world today, who the world looks upon them that yeah. they're, they're doing a whole lot of good. Uh, you know, creating things that make foods last longer, or yes. taking vaccines to poorer countries, uh, yeah. creating genetically modified food. Well, sure. this all seems like we're trying to save humanity. This seems like a good thing. Yeah, and, and probably well, a lot of it is is pretty decent. Some, you know? some, some of it is decent, and some you know? of it is mm, yeah, some of it's nefarious, here. right? Yeah. You know, but again, everything that can be used for good can also be used for evil, right? And, and so this is where you have the, you know the evil the evil genius that comes in, right? Mm. And this is where Therian. You know, he's sort of working behind the scenes. He's he's letting people do their thing, but he's all going to bring it together to serve himself. Mm. And um, all right, so why would people get to this point of taking the MRC or the mark? Okay, yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I heard it was going to be the barcode. You know, and we're all going to have a barcode stuck on our head. You know, like well, that's never going to yeah. happen. A chip or in your hand. The chip in your hand, so you can just wave it across the scanner at, at Walmart and You check. can do that today <laughs> at Whole Foods, by the way. Did you know that? It'll recognize your palm. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. That's, they have right. that here. I saw one in Asheville, North Carolina. Wow. And it freaked me out. I'm like, <laughs> I'll use cash, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is kind of weird. Uh, I, I personally don't think that's related to the mark. No, but, not you know, no. but they're But they're all bricks in the wall here, right? Sure. So, yep. you know, and so what I would suggest is that it's not for convenience that people will take the mark. It's for fear, mm. all right? And so this takes us back to the two witnesses, right? It takes us back to the two witnesses. That's why they are so important. Mm. 
So we're flipping the script, right? Uh, if you have a hostile alien force that's coming to destroy planet Earth, what should our response be? Well, hey guys, we all need to, to get ready. You know, we need to stock provisions. We need to get the army ready. Uh, I need to get myself ready. What can I do? Right. Forget our differences and band together and defeat the exactly. common enemy. Right. Now we know the enemy because we already saw a preview in the two witnesses. So if there's this, this hostile army that's coming and they're similar to the two witnesses, well, our earthly weapons were no match against them. So what do we need to do? Well, this is where I think that Enlil, who is the uh, ancient alien, okay, who is an evolved being, okay? Mm -hmm. he, he didn't start off this way, but through evolution, he eventually figured out whole kind, many, many, many secrets of the universe. He's been sort of our champion, kind of fighting against the, the evil God of the Bible, who has been trying to take away all of our fun uh, and uh, you know, oppress us and you know, mm -hmm. do all these terrible things to us. So he's going to then merge with Alexander Therian, mm -hmm. right? And Alexander Therian is gonna take this upon himself sort of sacrificially because he's doing it for the good of humanity and he needs to fight against these two witnesses. And only by this merger of these two can this actually happen. Now, I spent three books, Corrupting the Image 1, 2, and 3, talking about how I think this is all going to happen, right? So it started, the prophecy started in the garden. You know, I will cause enmity between you, Satan, and the woman between your seed and her seed, all right? So a lot of words have been <laughs> written on this, on this various topic, but essentially seed is information. Satan has information. God has information. First John 3, 9, no one having been born again continues to sin for the seed of God dwells in him. I'm like, whoa, that's pretty weird, okay. So in Crypto Image 1, uh, which is, I'm just coming out with the new revised and updated version. Oh, uh, so okay. people wanna check that out. Um, but I really go into the genetics a whole bunch. Right? And then book two, I go into the ancient history, and then book three, I'd look more toward the future. But you know, that's where I think it all begins. And then you have, of course, the Nephilim. Well, the sons of God come down, they breed with women, they create this Nephilim race, this hybrid race. It's been about hybrids, yeah. right? Yeah. That's kind of mixing. The, the mixing, right? You know, and, and that's why, you know, you can certainly be a good Christian without understanding the Nephilim and all that stuff, but you're gonna miss a lot of the story if you leave that out. So when you put that back in the story, you're like, oh, right? And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, right? Mm. So this is where I think it's all gonna culminate and the, the Satan and the Antichrist are gonna merge. Um, and this is actually part of the secret of the name Gog, right? Gog and Magog, right? Mm, okay. Right. So there's a whole thing there. But uh, that's probably for another another discussion. Because <laughs> there's so that sounds much. like a can of worms. Oh my goodness, it's an amazing <laughs> can of worms. Okay, it really is. All right, but uh, but it's it's the, it's the commingling of these two to make this hybrid uh, being hmm. known as the Beast. I think that's why he's called the Beast, honestly. And he, and then he's going to then replicate himself and make his mark, his DNA available for humanity. Why would they take hmm. this? Again, not to check out faster at Walmart, but it's so that they can become gods themselves because of fear, because mm. they know that a hostile alien force is coming who wants to upset their way of life. Mm. And the only way to do it is for everybody to, to uh, level up, to basically become a god themselves. Mm. You know, this is not unlike, you know, this is a really like simplistic example, but we look at a few years ago when, when COVID came. Yeah. The whole world got on board like they've never done before. Yes. And everybody did the same thing or was, was, uh, was not threatened necessarily, but but put into fear yes. that they all had to yeah. uh, wear a mask and stay apart from each other and don't go to the store and you know and all this kind of stuff and everybody obeyed. Yes, and it was almost like a a, a trial run for this type of thing where <laughs> Could be. out of fear, yeah. okay, let's all band together and just do the same thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now imagine if you have a force coming from outside the world. Ronald Reagan actually, he quipped about this, right? He, mm. he was uh, hanging out with Gorbachev and he's like, just imagine if some alien force from outside our planet were to come and to threaten us. We put aside all these national differences and we'd rally together. And I'm like, <laughs> Wait, boy. Nod, nod. <laughs> yeah, like. You Where'd know, you come up with that one? <laughs> yeah, like amazing, right? And, and, and so again, that's where I think the whole, the whole alien uh, agenda 
is very important to mm. sort of set the stage so that when God does decide to pull up the curtain and he sends the two witnesses, mm -hmm. Satan has a ready response. And he says, no, 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 don't worry about those guys. I've been watching over and I'm here to protect you and I'm gonna make it all good, mm. right? But it's the fear. Fear is what drives people like nothing else, right? Fear will always motivate people more than pleasure, right? So, yeah. you know, people are gonna do something to avoid something painful first before they will do something for pleasure, okay? So um, this is, I think we just can't ignore the two witnesses, right? They're really the catalyst that's gonna drive the, uh, the end times. I think this is why the world will say, okay, we're willing to do these different things because we don't like the two witnesses, we don't like who they represent, mm. we don't like the army that's gonna come, right? And so Satan and the, the Antichrist, they merge. He then is now imbued with this power and he's able to go and kill the two witnesses, mm. right? And when he does that, the world's gonna say, who can make war with the beast? Well, of course, of course they're gonna say that because who can make war with, with them, right? So again, in the book, we have this where, where Alexander Therion, he, he eventually takes on this mantle, he becomes this hybridized creature, uh, he almost dies in the process, but you know, boy, it's good for, good for humanity that he's doing this, and he becomes really the world's first god, if you will. Maybe not the first one, but you know, he becomes a god, and he then can go into the temple, and he can say, I am God, right? It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, he says that he goes in and declares himself to be God, and he shows himself to be God. Right, so this isn't, these are not just empty words. Hmm. He has a demonstration of power that the world's like, oh, wow, that's pretty amazing, right? And so because he shows it, and I think the showing will be the killing of the two witnesses. Hmm. And I actually think this will happen on Passover. Oh, wow, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> now again, Cliffhanger, we've got about a minute left. So that was, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for another time. That's great. Okay, so, and, hey, you know what? If you find this to be really interesting stuff like I do, you know, tell your friends about it and, you know, share our YouTube page. Go to our, you know, go to the chat and uh, just share what you know there. Put a, put a link in there. Go to our Facebook page. Go to everywhere we have social media and spread this around, okay? We need you to do that. So thank you, first of all, for that. And thank you also for your donations to this program. It makes all of this possible. It's just the way the world works. We've gotta have money to make things happen, and we thank you for that. It's just a, a way, it's the way it's gotta happen, and we thank you for doing it in advance. And uh, we just really appreciate you. Thank you again for supporting Shabbat Night Live. Until next week, we bid you Shavua Tov. Have a good week. Whenever and wherever you are watching this broadcast, it represents hundreds of man hours of production and post-production, and then it goes out to the world in several different languages. Why is this possible? Is because people like you support this ministry. We do our best to get this out freely to the entire world. Freely, you have received. Now, this is your opportunity to do as Yeshua said and freely give. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.